This is the first image made by Ecuadorian artist Oswaldo Guayasamin that I've encountered. It's a picture that stayed with me, one that I thought about but for some reason never made a video on. It's a haunting painting titled Lagrimas de Sangre, or Tears of Blood. It's striking, it's scary, it's filled with pain, but I never thought it was as incisive as it is before making this video. This painting isn't just terrifying for the sake of being terrifying, but positions itself as one of his many artworks struggling for liberation. Let's take a look at Oswaldo Guayasamin's Lagrimas de Sangre. I think the best introduction to Guayasamin's work and character as an artist is to show you Ecuador's parliament. Its main room, hosting 137 members, is overshadowed by an immensely imposing mural. This mural was made by Guayasamin in 1988, and aside from the motif of hands, which we'll go back to later, there's this one image which was quite controversial. The Nazi-like figure with the letters CIA inscribed on its helmet. It deeply offended U.S. Secretary of State George P. Schultz when he visited the country. Guayasamin's intentions were clear, to denounce U.S. intervention in Latin America. The strength of his convictions permeate his art. Oswaldo Guayasamin was born in Quito, Ecuador, of an indigenous father and a mestiza mother. He was the oldest of ten and was brought up in poverty. While painting, he'd work driving taxis or trucks and, in 1932, Protests during the Four-Day War would kill his best friend, Manjares, resulting in Los Niños Muertos, one of his first paintings in 1941. At the age of 23 in 1942, he'd have his first exhibition where he'd be discovered by Nelson Rockefeller, who would buy some of his artworks and become a patron. Guayasamin's career is often separated into three periods, Huacainan, or the Trail of Tears, the Age of Anger, and later, the Age of Tenderness. Lagrimas de Sangre, the painting we'll be looking at, was made during the Age of Anger, so that's the period we'll be focusing on. The Age of Anger paintings were very often, if not always, social. He'd paint mostly portraits depicting poverty, injustice, human suffering, authoritarianism, racism. He'd very often depict these themes through hands. Hands can represent the working people, hands can represent labor, they can also represent pain. Here in Las Manos de la Protesta, Guayasamin relays pain not only through facial expression, though we can't even see the subject's eyes here, but through this person's hands. These hands are filled with bony, contorted fingers. The way these fingers unnaturally bend, the way they're scratched and distorted, conveys the pain of the subject. However, Guayasamin didn't only picture the hands of the oppressed, but also the hands of the oppressors. In Meeting at the Pentagon, a five-part series, Guayasamin shows five cartoonishly evil Americans, conveying their maliciousness through their facial expressions and their hands. This brings us to what sparked the Age of Anger and his Lagrimas de Sangre. After World War II, revolutions were brewing in the impoverished countries of Latin America. Socialist ideas were spreading like wildfire. The United States did not want any communist influence on the continent, so they intervened. The Cold War in Latin America, or U.S. intervention in Latin America, was an extremely bloody enterprise which would lead to the destabilization and impoverishment of an incredible amount of countries. Operation Condor, a campaign essentially promoting right-wing dictatorships in countries where democracy would enable socialism, was adopted by the CIA in November 1975. However, U.S. intervention in Latin America had already done damage by then. In 1954, the CIA organized a coup d'etat in Guatemala under codename Operation PB Success. The democratically elected president, Jacobo Arbenz, was replaced for the military dictator, Carlos Castillo Armas. In 1964, the democratically elected president of Brazil, Yao Goulart, was replaced by a military dictatorship that would last until 1985 the coup was backed by the United States. We could go on and on talking about the backing of the Contras in Nicaragua or of the death squads in El Salvador. We could talk about the 1963 coup d'etat in Ecuador, Guayasamin's home country, which, according to former CIA agent Philip G., was incited by the U.S. However, Lagrimas de Sangre, made in 1973, was dedicated to three people. Salvador Allende, Chile's former president, 
Victor Jara, a theater director and musician, and Pablo Neruda, a poet and diplomat. What these three men had in common was the fact that they were all murdered during the 1973 coup d'etat in Chile. Salvador Allende was a dangerously popular left-wing presidential candidate, at least dangerous to U.S. interests. The U.S. would meddle in the Chilean 1964 elections. In fact, when the church committee investigated years later, they discovered that the U.S. spent more money per capita to get the candidate it favored elected in Chile in 1964 than was spent by both presidential candidates Johnson and Goldwater in the 1964 election in the U.S. Similar efforts were made in 1970, but Allende's popularity was unshakable. When he won the presidential election in 1970, Nixon, Kissinger, and CIA director Richard Helms met. There was already a report, Annex NSSM 97, now declassified, which revealed plans to overthrow Allende in case he took office. Helms noted that there were two possible answers to the Chilean problem, the soft and the hardline sabotage their economy or install a military right-wing dictatorship like they've done before. The U.S. ambassador in Chile, Edward Corey, was given the job of implementing the soft line. Here's how he described his task. To do all within our power to condemn Chile and the Chileans to utmost deprivation and poverty. That was the soft line. But why was Allende feared by U.S. officials so much? It wasn't because of his program to give free milk to half a million impoverished children, but mostly because the U.S. feared that Chile would become an example of what a country could look like if they were economically independent. Allende wanted to nationalize major industries, including copper mining. To nationalize means to make an industry the property of the government, essentially transforming 100% of the profits of that industry into revenue for the government, which could then be redistributed through social services, healthcare, education, etc. If Chile was to gain possession of their major industries from multinational businesses, take the profit from these industries and invest in their infrastructure, that wouldn't only make it so the U.S. and other interests couldn't own Chilean resources, but that could have a snowball effect in other countries where they would also nationalize and exploit their own resources instead of having foreign interests do it. On September 11, 1973, Chile's economic, social, and political life would change forever. Allende was murdered alongside other prominent figures. The U.S.-backed right-wing military dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet was installed and would reign until 1990. Today is September 11th, which marks the 49th anniversary of this tragic event. Guayasamin understood the importance of this event and made Lagrimas de Sangre the same year. This perfectly captures the many emotions felt by Latin Americans during the 9-11 coup. Salvador Allende, a democratically elected president, was murdered and replaced by a military dictator backed by the most powerful country in the world so that this powerful country and its allies can continue to profit from Chile's resources. What can you do if you're an anti-imperialist Chilean or an anti-imperialist Guatemalan or an anti-imperialist Ecuadorian? The CIA and the United States made it clear that if you're a developing country, you can have a democracy as long as it doesn't harm U.S. interest. If it does, a brutal military dictatorship will be installed and there's nothing you'll be able to do about it. The 9-11 coup made it clear that democracy, voting, participating in electoral politics could not be a way to combat imperialism anymore. The 9-11 coup essentially made a whole population powerless in front of U.S. domination and exploitation. Guayasamin seems to be portraying a reaction to the news, a reaction to the fatalistic realization that there's no alternative to U.S. hegemony. First, there's the fingers covering three-fourths of the composition. Just like in Las Manos de Protesta made five years earlier, the fingers are crooked, bony, but not as tense this time. These hands are still dirty and used, they're still the hands of the oppressed, but they're not in pain, not as they were in Las Manos de Protesta. These hands don't signal pain or suffering, but disbelief and shock. They're clumsily covering the subject's mouth. 
Secondly, the subject's eyes pierce the canvas to stare directly at us. They don't convey pain or disbelief, but fear. They're essentially two bright circles emerging from deep, dark sockets. The pupils are simple dots, making the eyes appear larger than they are. Fear is not only conveyed through the subject's eyes, but also through the darkness surrounding them. Thirdly, one element distinguishes itself from the rest of the painting through the fact that it has color. The painting gets its title from these red tears. We don't know how many tears there are, the subject is hiding them with their fingers. Of course, these tears relay sadness as tears often symbolically represent, but tears of blood have an added element of pain, perhaps even a slow death as vital energy leaves your body as if the sadness in itself became a hemorrhage. The fight against capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, and other forms of oppression would, of course, continue, and still continue today all across the world. However, Guayasemin saw in the 9-11 coup the destruction of hope for a better world. How exciting it must have been to see a president prioritizing his own people and his own country, putting the national interest above the US foreign interest. How exciting it must have been to see this being achieved peacefully, democratically, hoping it will work, hoping it will inspire other countries to do the same, to do it peacefully and democratically. But how painful, how terrifying, how crushing would it feel to see foreign interests decide for you, for your country, that you will be and continue to be a people and a land open and available to generate profits for foreign investors. How painful, terrifying, and crushing must it feel to become powerless, to be stripped of your agency so foreign capitalists can keep making more money. It's really hard to understand the extent of that pain, that terror, and that oppression if you don't experience it. Guayasemin, through some of the most expressive images in art history, tried to convey these emotions, tried to best describe the experience, not through words, but through images. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for liking and subscribing if you have already. And I'd like to thank Mike Wex, Roman Brandel, and every other patron for supporting the channel. If you also want to support the channel, check out patreon.com forward slash the canvas. Thank you.